Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFMLP 103.3 in Asheville, North Carolina, this is The Final Straw, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcast and podcast emanating out of occupied Jalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices from struggles for liberation from all around the world. Welcome. Asheville Survival Program is an autonomous mutual aid network formed in early 2020 at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in so-called Asheville, North Carolina. They're building mutual aid with oppressed communities, promoting solidarity and sharing outside of the bounds of the state structure through their street side camping gear, food and solidarity distro, as well as their Until We're All Free free store, holding a distribution space open a few hours a week for walk up visits and delivering groceries through a network of drivers. For the hour, I spoke with Fern and Ducky, two members of ASP affiliated with the Free Store, about the history of the group, challenges it's faced, the dynamics between charity and mutual aid, working to reach outside of subcultural and across racial and cultural lines and other topics. You can reach ASP on Instagram at at AVL Survival or on Fedbook via at ASP Donate. You can find more links, including how to donate at link tr.ee slash avl survival and you can also reach them at their email address asheville survival program at gmail.com now here are a few announcements we're excited to say that starting on the evening of halloween sunday october 31st 2021 we'll be airing on kpca lp community access radio in petaluma california If you're on occupied coastal Miwok and Pomo territories of southern Sonoma County and looking for a 10 p.m. political radio show, tune in at 103.3 FM. Check out tfsr.wtf slash radio or the radio tab on our website to see other radio broadcasts around the so-called U.S. that we have, as well as ways to get us up on your local airwaves and spread the anarchy that way. We produce a weekly 58-minute show that is free and FCC-friendly. Also, if you're in the Asheville area, check out the Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross Letter Writing Night on Sunday, November 7th from 5 to 7 p.m. at West Asheville Park at 198 Vermont Avenue. More details on the BRABC Instagram, Fedbook, and on their website at brabc.blackblogs.org. No letter writing experience is required. And they provide stationary names and addresses of prisoners with upcoming birthdays or who are facing repression. And now here are a couple of other prison-related updates. Revolutionary, anarcho-communist, urban guerrilla member of the George Jackson Brigade, white working-class Butch Dyke lesbian, anti-authoritarian, anti-imperialist, ex-political prisoner, Bo Brown, Rita Bo Brown, passed recently after a long battle with lewd body dementia. She'll be remembered by her many comrades, including in the prison abolitionist community around Oakland, California, where she was active in her later life. To see a beautiful poster designed by Josh McPhee of Just Seeds Collective, downloadable and printable for free, check out the link in our show notes or their website and social media. Bo's loved ones are also raising funds to help cover her funeral expenses via GoFundMe, which is entitled Show Up for Bo Brown. You can find a link in our show notes to that. Dedicated community activist, founding member of the Black Unity Council, former member of the Black Panther Party, and soldier of the Black Liberation Army, and now former political prisoner, Russell Maroon Schultz, has been given a quote-unquote compassionate release after years of medical neglect in the Pennsylvania prison system. Maroon has been released to an outside hospital to coordinate palliative and likely hospice care as he's in stage four of colorectal cancer. While it's great that Maroon gets to be near his family, this is 49 years too late, and the victory rings a bit hollow to receive this fighter back into our midst after such mistreatment. There's a fundraiser at GoFundMe, also, entitled Homegoing Service for Richard Schotes, S-H-O-A-T-E-S. You can find that linked in our show, and you can find out more about Maroon at his support site, russellmaroonschotes.wordpress.com and find his book, Maroon the Implacable, from PM Press. Finally, some really good news. After decades of pressure, notably by releasing aging people in prison or rap, former Weather Underground and May 19th Communist Organization political prisoner David Gilbert is expected to be released 
In November of 2021, he was granted a partial commutation by outgoing New York Governor Cuomo, and the parole board announced that it was granting him parole just recently on the 26th. David was arrested after the Brinks armed car robbery in 1981, led by a Black Liberation Army unit. Free them all. Hi, my name's Fern. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm part of Asheville Survival Program. Uh, And I'm Ducky. I use they, them pronouns, also part of Asheville Survival Program. So I'm very excited to talk to y'all about ASP, or Asheville Survival Program, and being that y'all are longtime participants in it. I was involved in ASP for about five months at the beginning with my participation tapering off after a while. So I'm excited to hear about what's been going on. Thanks for finding the time to chat. Would folks mind giving an overview of ASP, sort of how the project developed, where the name comes from, and how you've seen its scope change as time has passed? So Asheville Survival Program was co-created at the beginning of the pandemic, like April 2020, uh, primarily by a group of self-identified anarchists who were hoping to start a mutual aid project uh, and do disaster relief in the wake of like social services shutting down at the onset of the pandemic. The name Asheville Survival Program takes its inspiration from the Black Panther Party's survival programs, which were one of the arms of the Black Panther Party's project, um, basically helping people meet survival needs as part of like the political goals of that project. Interestingly enough, I think both Fern and I got involved right as folks that had kind of bottom lined the creation of the project were mi- many of them stepping back because of burnout. So like we entered the project at this like unusual transition time. But at this point, like the shape of the project has remained fairly consistent for like the past eight months or so at least where we have a group that does a street side distro, which Fern and I are not super directly involved with. But then there's also a location called the Free Store. Its full name is the Until We're All Free Store, where, yeah, we distro free groceries. We'll do free grocery deliveries and kind of just exist as like an aid space in opposition to state power in Asheville. Yeah, and one thing I'll add is that there are a number of kind of auxiliary working groups that feed into supporting these two central projects. So, for example, we have a working group of folks who drive the grocery deliveries that we have. We have a working group that cooks big hot meals for our street side food distribution every week. And so there's a lot of overlap between all of the different groups and subgroups. That's really awesome. What does the ASP operation look like a year and a half after its inception? Are there, like you mentioned that you both kind of came in at a time when people who had initiated it were stepping back due to burnout or um, having to take on other stuff going on in their lives. But um, are there any folks that are still around who have been there since the beginning and who is involved? Like, is it folks from political subculture? Is it faith inspired folks or folks from the community that you mostly operate the um, until we're all free story in? I'll, okay, I'll go again. Uh, Fern like nodded at me and I was like, okay. So I guess in terms of the way the the day-to-day operations of the project have shifted is I think kind of operating around this idea of trying to do smaller things really well, this idea of under-promising and then over-delivering. When the store itself initially opened, it was closed to the public, but like staffed seven days a week. We're not only staffed like three days a week and only open to the public two of those days. And that just reflects the capa- our capacity to staff the store and like the physical resources we can actually fit in the space. It's not a huge space. And like it gets real full by the time we have enough stuff to like distro for a weekend. Like we're here now and like they're just mountains of boxes all around us. We're literally just sitting under like, you know, a, a stack of cornflake boxes eight high just that's just tipping precariously over us yeah which you know great happy to have all those cornflakes but (laughs) Um, make sure that the fire marshal isn't hearing this right now (laughs) it's uh they're six feet they're six inches off the ground so it's fine hey um that's all that matters um so there's that component of it so like yeah so day-to-day operations we just like are destroying uh resources talking to people building relationships cultivating connection in terms of like who's actually involved in decision making of the project, it's a pretty small group of people that are like consistently involved in that. There are a lot of different factors that at play there. I would say ultimately the vast majority of people involved are just like folks coming from political subcultures, namely like the leftist anarchist scene <clears throat> in Asheville. 
which also means that ultimately like 90 percent of the people involved are white folks as well which is just like also the reality of being in Asheville, which is just like such an aggressively white place did that answer that whole question i got a little lost in the sauce yeah, I kind of extended out the the question a bit. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Like the majority of people, at least where the free store is situated, there's like a large black community in the area. There's also public housing in the area. Is there anything you can share about like how it's felt? Like have have has the project tried inviting folks, and how has that looked? Uh, or has it just been like a an instance where like folks who are working there have just been building relationships with the folks that come up and get the resources and you, you all also take the resources. I guess I, I want to think that we are trending toward greater involvement from the community that we are situated in. And since I've been involved with the project, which is coming up on just about a year now, um, I have definitely seen a small but measurable change in um, you know, kind of the level of participation. And I think a lot of that has to do is that we are, you know, like like Ducky said, like a predominantly white group coming into a uh, area that is predominantly people of color. And there is just inherently a lot of distrust and especially coming in to a space where like none of us actually live, you know, for the most part. It just takes time to start yeah, building those relationships. And uh, at the end of the day, something that we've been talking about a lot is like, we can try as hard as we want to as a collective to like build trust. But in reality, it comes down to individuals like showing up enough to build actual relationships with actual people and not like our community building relationships with another community or the community that we are, you know, occupying space in. How does ASP relate to NGOs or nonprofits or charities? Like if ASP is, is not incorporated, and doesn't have like an official status, are there challenges of getting access to resources from those sectors that do, or have relationships been built that allow y'all to work together with those sorts of groups? Are there tensions there? I know y'all were sharing space with Steady Collective, a harm reduction collective, which is really awesome. And we've had on the show a couple times. Yeah, I can, I can speak to a little bit about kind of our, because it has been a process of like, procuring all of the resources that we are able to distribute in in the free store and through other aspects of the project you know for quite some time we have been receiving a lot of the food that we distribute through one of the larger food banks in in the Asheville area and they explicitly only partner with nonprofits and we are not in any way a nonprofit and so we started out with having a very under the table relationship with a nonprofit that other members of the organization of our collective were involved with and then sort of using that as a way to start getting some of those resources but it was all very you know no paper trail uh to the best of our abilities but over time i think i don't know if it's necessarily trust rather than like for example this food bank has realized what is happening and has decided that they're okay with it. Um, and now we are per coming up, coming to them as Asheville survival program and not this other nonprofit that we were working through. Um, just, and you know, there are, are elements of that where we do have to sort of comply to these standards uh, that nonprofits have for a variety of reasons. For example, you know, we, have to store all of our food properly and like there is some degree of keeping up on that and like that's all well and good i i would hope that we would be storing our food in a way that is safe for for people but th there is this sort of fear of like nonprofit creep into our uh non nonprofit organization yeah should i do you want me to, i can say more sure uh just like in terms of like so as a collective that like has like a a strong like commitment to organizing as like against the state outside of the bounds of the state. The idea of incorporating as a nonprofit is like pretty controversial within the collective, especially for like the idea of incorporating the collective as a whole. I think when we've seriously talked about trying to incorporate, it has been less because of a need to gain access to like material resources because we found ways to build relationships with either 
nonprofits or like people in nonprofits more often that allow us to gain access to resources that normally we would not be available to us as like a loose collective of individuals, but where the conversation around becoming a nonprofit has come up multiple times. And we still have like settled on not doing it as like managing our finances just because like trying to figure out how to manage finances as like this non-legal entity using the currency of the state has felt complicated at times. And at this point in time, I don't think we're seriously considering incorporating, but when it has come up in a real way, it's actually been like, how do we cover each other's butts when handling money is incorporating as a nonprofit the best way to do that? And so far the answer has been no. There was a discussion when I was engaging with the collective and there were these unwieldy meetings of like 40 people on signal, just trying to, but it was just everyone talking over each other. So I don't know how decisions got made, but there was discussion and there was like pushback from a couple of different sides about the idea of using the space and using the service as an opportunity to share political, to share political content. Um, when I would package up food boxes, frequently I would put in copies of like Know Your Rights information or harm reduction pamphlets or um, sometimes like the cop type things. Nothing that was too that was too political necessarily. A lot of it was just about like critically like starting conversations around like civil liberties issues, quote unquote. But there was a big push against us having a political education component to the food distribution, which was a thing that the black, the original black Panther party had done with their breakfast programs and with their clinics and, and other like other outreach survival programs that they had done. Does ASP or does the free store actually engage with any sort of this, or is there much discourse or comfort or discomfort levels? Like, I could be creepy if it feels like, you know, like you have to listen to our screed in order to get the food or you have to believe what we believe in order to get your pine glow or whatever. Yeah, uh, this is something that especially this current iteration of the free stores working group is really in dialogue around a lot. Like Fern and I talk about this all the time. Ultimately, I think because we're named after the Black Panther survival programs, if we're going to like be, if we're going to be, if we're going to honor that tradition and acknowledge it in a real way, some aspect of the work we need to be doing is having like an explicit political agenda to the work we're doing. And that doesn't mean being like the only way people can access resources is by listening to our spiel, but something that we've run into consistently, especially, and this is something I thought to mention earlier in the interview, but many of the folks involved in running the store at this point, perhaps all of us, um, have not actually been radicalized for that long, um, like have only been involved in this kind of organizing more or less since the pandemic began. And so many of us just like don't have a lot of experience like articulating our beliefs to other people. Um, so when people ask us why we're here, like because people are genuinely curious, they're like, wow, these like dirty punk kids are like kind of always here giving out pine glow and shit. I hope I can say, I don't know if I can Yeah, say go shit. ahead, I'm gonna okay. edit it, yeah. Great. but. Um, when a lot of us speak to this experience, when we're asked that question of just being like, oh, you know, we're here because we care about people and like giving like false answers, essentially, because we don't have comfort around talking about like the ideology that drives this work, which is primarily that we believe that like the state and those in power actively benefit from the oppression of everyone who doesn't have that level of power and access to resources. And so by like destroying resources, we like are committing to these values of like challenging state oppression and like the hoarding of resources by those in power. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and something that I have only recently been able to really like put into words for myself, but it speaks to kind of that discomfort of like uh, this sort of basic unwillingness to discuss the politics that are control, you know, determining whether or not we're showing up or not is that like, I think it's, in many ways, pretty detrimental to the work that we're trying to do mm -hmm. to keep these political conversations separate because it's not genuine. And, uh, you know, I think many of the people that we're interacting with in the community where the free store physically is have great familiarity with the lack of support they receive from the state and like are mad about it and have reactions to it and have lots of much more lived experience than many of the folks who are involved in ASP as a collective. 
and us just beating around the bush and trying to kind of like be wary of of folks in a sense because you know we don't we don't want to start anything like there's always a chance that you might say the wrong thing to the wrong person and they disagree with you for whatever reason but in general like we're all on the same page about a lot of this stuff and it really is just a matter of like what language we're using to Mm -hmm. talk about it and like what kind of framework we're using to approach it um and so i i am definitely in in the camp that thinks that we should be doing more like explicitly political stuff not even necessarily like political education Mm -hmm. because as ducky said like so many of us are still in relatively early stages of our own political education that like it doesn't really feel fair to be like yeah this is what you should think person but like there's so much to be learned just by having these conversations over and over again with as many people as possible. And so, yeah, I think, I think as a collective, there is starting to be a shift toward being more comfortable, uh, being more explicitly political. I mean, I think also that once again, jumping off of what Fern just said there, there's this reality too, that Fern was already speaking to that many of the people that like, are collaborating with us to get their survival needs met by coming to the store to just get some stuff that they need. Like when I said, agree with many of the values that we already hold as like an anti-authoritarian, anti-state, blah, 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 anti-capitalist collective, abolitionist collective. But the words we use to describe our values are just basically jargon. Uh, And so I think that ultimately is where we also have to do work as a collective to be like, one, people, people can understand ideas, not to be like, oh, if we use this jargon, people won't get it. But to be like, we kind of already agree. You probably have already heard this phrase before too, but this is what we mean when we say it. So like an example of one idea that we've had about trying to make the space more political and also at the same time, make it look nicer because like being able to shop someplace for groceries that you need at a grocery store that looks nice. It's also a really nice thing. It's just like putting big posters up in the windows with different like statements on them and one idea that we've been circulating right now is trying to find a really good compact definition of what abolitionism is and just put that in huge letters on one of our big storefront windows because like that's abolition is like kind of the crux of why we're doing this work because like if you abolish prisons you abolish police part of that work also involves just like dismantling the whole system of oppression and so that's like why we're here is because we want those systems of oppression to come to an end well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it feels like um, it feels like to not engage with folks politically. Yeah. As if as if people don't have opinions and if as if their lived experiences and opinions aren't worth hearing or as if y'all's perspectives wouldn't withstand like a uh, healthy, like trustful dialogue, like as was stated early on, like I could see it feeling, you know, building trust with the community is like building these relationships and it's based on people showing up and being real. And like, if, if you're just like, Oh, I don't know. I'm just here. Cause uh, you know, it feels nice and just kind of <laughs> avoiding mm-hmm. using words, you know, that, that might touch someone off or make, make them like, or challenge them or whatever that uh, playing like kid gloves with, with grown people, you know, and instead of engaging them in, in, mutual political organizing that that seems like kind of the difference there i feel like i participated in stifling the conversation a bit at the time when we were discussing it earlier on but i think a part of my initial response was like i don't want this to feel like a church kitchen where you have to hear a sermon in order to get food yeah i mean it is a really like there is a balance and to me i think that be like being political and especially like being politically like anti-statist is really a huge part of the difference between mutual aid and charity models and because like charity has so much of that baggage of like denying access based on certain factors based on sobriety based on whether or not you're willing to be proselytized to and so many other things that like in in the way that we're trying to distribute things and in the way that we're trying to approach this project as a whole like we really want to say no to people as little as we physically can like when we're out of something it's like yeah like we don't have any more of that but let me put an order in and you'll you can get it next week you know like not asking any questions not like assuming that people don't know what they need or what they want 
And I don't think that adding on a component of like, hey, we're going to like put some stuff up in our windows. We're going to like hand some stuff out. Like that doesn't stop people from, you know, they're not, they can still get everything that they were getting. And maybe we can start sparking more of those conversations in, in both directions. Maybe we'll find more common ground with people. Maybe we'll get a ton of pushback. And like, that will also be equally as informative and equally as, as worthwhile, in my opinion, because like, yeah, it is mutual aid is about relationship building and relationship building is arguing with your family, arguing with your friends, like, Mm -hmm. Um, and growing through that. So the next question that I, I had in here was, have you been able to develop relationships for sourcing the distributable goods that don't rely on commerce, like local farmers giving up surplus because they want the food to end up in good hands? I think ultimately <laughs> most of our sourcing and why, again, not necessarily having to incorporate, like part of why we haven't had to incorporate to collect resources is we have relationships with people that work for other that work for nonprofits in town that end up with surplus. Uh, and we end up destroying that surplus because folks will be like, we actually can't destroy this. Can y'all destroy it? Because we know that you are in a location where it'll get to people who need it. Inconsistently we'll have folks in the community provide resources to us and share them like clothes or something that we often have. And those are all just like things that people drop off. And I would say that's the most consistent, resource that we're able to redistro that is like coming from like totally autonomous non-NGO nonprofit locations. So Although that's... one one thing I'll tack on to that is I think we perhaps like Asheville as a whole has sort of a willingness to share information about windfalls. And I think there is an especially a lot of motivation and energy devoted within the collective to taking advantage of those windfalls. Like, for example, a certain food producer that was formerly based out of Asheville, um, but is leaving due to some... uh, Because they're shitty bosses? Because because they're shitty bosses and... uh, I'm just guessing. Yeah, you're guessing accurately. (laughs) Um, You know, like, someone who knows someone who works at the free store was like, hey, I'm clearing out their entire production space. Like, do you want a ton of industrial cookware and like you know hotel service wear and i was like oh i'm already out running errands in north asheville i can show up there in half an hour and we just got you know hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of equipment for nothing just because we know someone who knows someone which is just a testament to Mm -hmm. the power of community and the power of having the mindset of like hmm i have all this stuff sitting here laying around that's just gonna you know either get donated to a nonprofit or like get thrown away Maybe I should try to have something else happen to it. And I I think that that is like sort of a cultural shift because I don't know, especially like so many random people just show up at the free store like, hey, uh, I like saw an Instagram post about you. Here's all this random stuff I have. I'm moving and I didn't want to bring it to, you know, Habitat for Humanity or whoever. It's like, great. It's going to go out the door today instead of like getting shipped around the country and you know, then half of it will end up in the landfill anyway. So circling back to the the mutual aid versus charity thing, can you talk about your concept of mutual aid? Like, I'm sure everyone's got a slightly different answer in, in the collective and in all the groups, but just how you feel your work has differed from charity. How has it been to try to challenge the dynamic of charity? And how do you think that y'all have done? I'll I'll start with an answer on that one. Before I go, I wanted to reiterate this at the beginning and I forgot to like, we're all such baby radicals in this working group at this point. So all these ideas that we have are just like coming from this like huge tradition of primarily like BIPOC folks that have like built these ideas up. So I'm just going to say a bunch of stuff, but I just like at some point in this interview wanted to say that, that like saying all these things and all of these things are just straight up stolen, stolen, (laughs) stole them all. Um, But anyway, I think for me, there are two primary aspects define or rather differentiate mutual aid from charity. One of those is something that Fern already spoke to, which is tearing down this barrier of separation between people who seek aid and give aid, getting to a point where there is no like, no tangible difference in the way we're working and organizing and, and being in community with each other that like creates a hierarchy on the basis of need in terms of like, these are the people that help people and these are the people that get helped, getting to a point where like resources and care because we have real authentic caring relationships with each other are 
distributed in a way that doesn't have this like weird dichotomy to it. So that's one part of it. Um, and then the other part for me is this idea that mutual aid should be doing work that challenges the systems of oppression uh, that create the need for that work. We mostly do survival work as a collective, collaborating with people to support their survival needs. If we want to continue to call ourselves a mutual aid project and and be honest when we say it, I think the next step in this collective development is thinking about ways that we can be explicit in challenging the systems of oppression that create the need for, for the project in the first place. And I don't know if we've done, we're working on that first thing for sure. I think we are doing good work in building like relationships where people trust us because we've been around for almost two full years and like we still show up. And I think folks are used to people showing up for like a couple months and then disappearing. Um, but that second part where we actually like challenge the systems that create the need for the work we do. I don't see us doing that very much as a collective, at least not yet. I'm, I'm check. Um, yeah, I feel like I have something to add to that. Um, maybe just that, yeah, I mean, sort of, I think calling ourselves a survival program is accurate, bearing in mind that like the sort of theory behind the survival program model as, you know, uh perpetuated by the black panther party was like people can't like it's it is impossible for people to engage in political work if their basic needs are not met um and we're still in a time of active crisis and there's still an immense amount working against anyone finding any sort of stability during this in general and also with these like sort of compounded crises that we're experiencing um and, you know, I think there, yeah, it's like we're, we've got to get to a place where we have real trusting relationships with people and are like, those people that we are in relationship with are not struggling to survive. And we can start having those conversations about like, kind of the more political aspect of the project. But in terms of like, the energy that we're expending on the work that we're doing, I think ultimately, yeah, like like Ducky said, we're still in kind of stage one because there is just there's a a lot of a lot of needs that aren't getting met in our community. There's another member of our collective who says this a lot. I'm not sure I'm not sure where this phrase originates from. Maybe that maybe it's an original of theirs, but it's uh all the work we do has to move at the speed of trust. And I really like when this person says that because it's a good reminder that while it can be frustrating to be like man, we're just like kind of doing charity work, dang. But also recognizing that moment that like the reason why we're in this model where we are essentially doing charity work with like some like anarchist slogans plastered over it is because it takes time to build the kind of connection and trust in a community such that we are actually part, like we as individuals are also part of that community before we can, can do the real work of mutual aid, which is changing things in a real way. Yeah, and I guess it's important, like, bringing it back to the Panther naming of it, like, survival programs pending revolution, you know, that's, that's like, the full name of it. And it sounds, I mean, it sounds like the work that you're doing right now is trying to lay the groundwork for being able to have a revolutionary or a capacity for revolutionary relationships with, with other folks. Which and is, with each other. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. good. Go for it. Yeah, I mean, also with each other, I think something that I've been learning by being part of this collective is like the necessity of relying on your friends and comrades to support you and give care when you need it, which I, you know, white supremacy teaches us that that's not the case. Like we live in a highly individualistic society that teaches you to like not reach out to others when you need help, stigmatizes it. The Final Straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CZN. After the 2016 election, a lot of us woke up to some harsh realities. In the aftermath of dark events, I came back to political work with a new sense of urgency. But after a few months of showing up to protest every weekend, I started to burn out. It didn't feel like anything was changing. In fact, maybe things were even getting worse. And it got me thinking, what comes next? Rebel Steps is a podcast about what comes next. You'll hear episodes on letter writing to political prisoners, practicing mutual aid, and creating political art. You'll hear the voices and stories of my community in New York City, spotlighting a range of organizers from the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council, NYC Books Through Bars, Anarchist Black Cross, Lower Manhattan Food Not Bombs, Brand Workers, and more. 
I'll walk you through what you can do to start plugging into movements and learning organizing skills step by step. If you've been to a march or two and you're looking to jump in, this podcast is for you. Or if you have friends looking for more, pass it on. Listen at rebelsteps.com, on iTunes, or wherever you get your podcast. So there's a one of the oft pointed to an, like anarchist adjacent or anarchist projects of of support that sort of like echoes the work that ASP does. I guess both between street side and and the free store to some degree is food not bombs, and food not bombs has gotten a very bad rap over the years for doing for like what some people have said like doing charity but without the resources of what other institutions do. Like there, like there's a soup kitchen down the street that maybe can more efficiently produce meals for people and fill that gap that the system is leaving. But the saving grace of the Food Not Bombs model is that it is a DIY self-organized attempt at, that is inherently politicized by its name, attempt at providing meals, building companionship and and collaboration between folks as well as filling a need that people have and and oftentimes there's that political component like when when i used to participate with a food net bombs on the west coast i'd just bring like a stack of zines and a table and just like you know have them there for people to pick up if they wanted to or if they wanted to have a a chat about the content but like a critique of of that not doing the thing well is I think is like heard in some in sometimes like people kind of like th- throw together stuff that they're willing to eat maybe tastes good for them but maybe isn't that enticing for other folks who are coming to it and it sounds like with it sounds like some of the work that y'all have been doing in the space has been trying to make it more appealing to folks and not feel like you get to come here like not not like I don't know the bread and roses idea like if we're going to provide a thing for people providing beautiful things that are like healthy and that are enjoyable as a sign of like mutual respect, as opposed to the often dark and dank ways that folks have to navigate the charity system in a way that like demeans them and makes them feel small and makes them feel like they're getting a handout. I guess it's not really so much of a question, but I wonder if you could um, like talk about, the importance of mutual aid work, taking care that the food that's on the shelf is not overdate, taking care that it's, you know, it's the kind of stuff that you would want to eat. It's like you're actually showing love by providing this stuff. Sorry, that was rambly, but it was kind of off the cuff. Do you have any thoughts on that or should we just skip? Yeah, I I, I think I do have some thoughts about that. That is something that we definitely have talked about at, at, at various times. There, what I'm thinking of when you asked that is right when I first started getting involved in the free store specifically um, around this time last year, it was this period of transition uh, that Ducky talked about. And so I think a lot of that knowledge had like got lost in transmission somewhere. Like that was something that like, as we started, you know, opening up the store a little bit more and like having folks come up to the window and like be able to place orders or just like tell us what they would like to have you know, I think there was sort of a period of like unconscientiousness where we were like, oh, we have all this stuff that we need a distro and like people don't necessarily know it's here. Let's just put it outside. And like boxes of food were going on the ground. And like there was this conversation that we had that really stands out to me is like basically to your point, like what the hell? Like it's it's already so difficult to get food when you don't have money. Like don't make people stoop over for it, you know? Mm. Like put it on a table, make it look presentable, go through it, take out anything that looks even a little bit off, even though there is this sort of like, you know, I come from in my college years doing a lot of dumpster diving and like not really caring, like, like, Oh yeah. Like this food is fine. Like it looks weird, but it's fine. And like me as someone with a lot of class and race privilege, like that was my reaction to, to my upbringing is like, Oh, we're so wasteful as a society, but like, that's not going to be other people's reactions who come from different backgrounds than I do because they would much rather just have food that is like tasty and fresh and like looks as good as it would if they were getting it from a grocery store. And so like, I definitely coming into this project, like wouldn't have really thought of it. And it wasn't until we started having those very explicit conversations about like, you know, this sort of presentation aspect. Um, Cause it says a lot about what we're trying to do. Like, are we throwing shit in boxes outside on the sidewalk or are we like placing it and like taking care to make sure it's actually like high quality stuff. Like we throw away 
more stuff than, you know, I would if it was just going to my house for me to eat. Because I'm like, whatever, like, it's just food. But, like, people just have, you know, there's so much, like, societal baggage about, like, who gets to eat what. And I think, yeah, it's very important to keep in mind because it's so easy just to want to distro everything because it's all technically good. But, mm -hmm. yeah, it comes, comes with a lot of a lot of other stuff attached. And I think another part to that, too, is like over time, because Fern and myself and some other people that are pretty involved in the store at various points have just like been here every day that the stores opened at various times and just like been here talking to people. So over time, we're able to just like, I think we do a good job of eventually shifting to getting more of the things that people specifically request. Like an example is this, there's this sweet guy who comes by all the time and was always like, do y'all have ramen? And we never stocked ramen, but like we were able to start spending more money on food. So now I like always buy ramen. People love ramen. Another thing that people often would ask for is like juice packet, flavor packets or like Kool-Aid. And so now we buy Kool-Aid because we don't ever get it for free. So we can give that out to folks as well. And like the way we have like cleaning supplies, because no one can buy cleaning supplies with their fucking EBT. So people are like, I need bleach, I need pine glow, I need dish soap, I need trash bags, I need toilet tissue. Um, and folks also always ask for paper towels, which we don't have, but I think we're going to start buying them because like everybody always wants paper towels and like folks really appreciate it when they know that if they like give us feedback, we eventually are like, okay, we're going to make it happen so that this thing that everyone is requesting, we can get so that it can be distroed out. Yeah. And, and kind of related to that, this thought came to me, came up for me when you were asking the initial question in terms of like thinking about what the difference between mutual aid and charity is, I think is that factor of immediacy. Like I think about if ASP had tried to start itself as a nonprofit at the beginning of the pandemic, like we wouldn't, we still wouldn't be a nonprofit. We wouldn't be here doing anything. And it's only because there was obviously this con conscious decision to pursue, you know, a mutual aid model, a survival program model of just like getting up and making it happen. And that also allows us so much more flexibility, like Ducky was saying, is like we can much more easily respond to people's needs when it's just like, OK, there's like lots of people asking for this one thing. Let's just have a, a, a brief chat in our in our group in our group text. And then it just happens as opposed to like having to get approval from your boss or like the board of a nonprofit. It's just you can just actually <laughs> respond to people's needs in an efficient manner. So the, the food deliveries are still happening. That all gets processed in the based on orders in the space, right? Yes. Yeah. And who are you trying to serve with that part? Uh, and r roughly how many people participate in that element of ASP and how many boxes of food? And these are like big boxes generally, but like how many boxes of food do you all distribute? I'm going to answer the first part of that first which is just kind of like how does the delivery packing of boxes even work how do how do we self-organize to do that for a long time what we were doing is we would be taking orders at the door we were taking orders via this hotline we were compiling all this information digitally and then while we had the door open so that people could also shop at the window we were also trying to pack all these orders and so this, this it was always total chaos being on yes. shift it was too much work <laughs> And what we recently shifted to in like the past month, which I think has been a super big and important shift is one thing we actually did is we closed our hotline because we weren't able to keep it consistently staffed. So when people would call, it would be a month before they would get an order back to them. Mm. So now we just take orders at the door. But the way we pack orders is we have a shift that is, is closed. The doors are closed. We've got curtains drawn. So it, it's hard to tell whether or not we're here. And we just pack all the orders for the week on that day. And then on Saturday and Sunday, when we're open to the public, all we have to do is hang out at the door, grab things for people, and like coordinate with the delivery drivers who are coming by to pick up these orders that are already packed. So it creates space on our shifts to actually just hang out and spend time with people instead of frantically being trying, being frantically trying to complete all these like contradictory tasks all at once. Do you want to speak to like numbers, or if you have more to say about that? Yeah, totally. Like that is such a huge shift. Is like I. You know, I took a few months off during the summer for a job I was working. And like up until that point, I had been working probably two shifts a week for several months. And it was, you know, I loved doing it. And like it felt important and rewarding, but also just so exhausting. And I never felt like I had as much time as I wanted to actually just chat with people and like be outside 
the the space because for now because of covid and the space is very small with poor ventilation um we're not for the most part letting folks in unless they're you know helping out or are in in some capacity or another and so it can be like this very transactional like here i am behind this little counter i'm taking your order like customer service mode all the time which obviously has to happen you know like we still want to get stuff out to people in a organized fashion um but yeah it was you know, if you had a lull in the folks coming to the door, it was like, okay, now I have to like pack orders. And like, you couldn't ever find a moment to just like go chill with the people who were hanging out outside. Um, Cause we're, we're in a little strip mall with a couple of other businesses that are very busy. And so there's always people around and always people to talk to who want to talk to you. And so, yeah, it, it definitely has been really nice in terms of numbers. I would say it varies anywhere between like, 30 and to like seven boxes a week um and a lot of stuff like people are just coming to the door and at, like getting a box when they when they're standing there but in terms of orders that are placed ahead of time um it does vary but is is consistently like i don't know maybe 20 households yeah i like a week yeah yeah i and i think it might be more than that i think yeah. on a busy day like anywhere between like 30 and 50 people will come to the store. Sure, yeah, coming to get yeah. smaller amounts so like, of stuff. So yeah. like in terms of boxes, yeah, I think like 20 households a week is about right. And then like adding that to the number of people that just come by and shop, it ends up being a much larger number of people that is like harder to quantify because we can count the number of deliveries we do, but there's no real way to keep track, at least that we've tried, of how many people come by the door and get stuff. Initially, there were, when ASP started up there were a lot of misunderstandings about transmission and so we and also roar um in madison county uh as another like mutual aid community organizing project rural organizing and resilience sort of like copied off of the asp model and we're doing the deliveries for people that thought that they might be have a higher possibility of transmission of the disease and so we would like let the food, let a food box like sit on the shelf for with the package goods for like three days and go through a quarantine period and sort of get moved from one part of the space into the other wrapped up in two plastic bags so that we could just on delivery rip open the outer bag and they could come and grab the inner bag and take that inside. It was pretty well thought out for like what we thought was going on but like who who gets the food deliveries these days is there any presumption of about like transmission or is it just kind of like anyone that asks like they might have mobility issues they might have um, health concerns or they just might not have enough time in their day and this will really help them out yeah i mean the double bag method of of deliveries i started in asp as a delivery driver right as right as we transitioned out of that and i think ultimately we just gave up on even asking people if they wanted us to decontaminate their food because we, people would be like, we'd be like, do you want us to deliver it soon or in like three days to a week? And people would be like, right now, please. What's interesting is I don't actually really think that since we dropped the hotline, the people that we were delivering to have shifted that much. Like almost all of our deliveries anyway, we're just going up to people who mostly live in the public housing complex, like right up the hill from where the store is. But for me at this point, I think the focus of this aspect of the project, the free store is just becoming a more real part of the community of this neighborhood. And so for me, when we take orders, at the door for folks that live around here. That's for folks that can't carry like a 40 pound box to their house, don't want to carry a 40 pound box to their house or like are placing orders for their neighbors who are not able to leave the house right now. Um, and for me, that just like reflects less of like being able to like actually offer realistically prioritizing people that can't leave the house because of the pandemic because we don't have a good way to stay in touch with those folks. So we can't really say we're offering that, but just prioritizing folks that we have relationship with who like state needs and we're like, let's collaborate to get those needs met. Does that feel accurate, Fern? Mm -hmm. How has the project fared in terms of resisting burnout, having an ongoing institutional memory and challenging informal hierarchies within ASP um, that sort of naturally develop in, in scenes and in communities? 
Yeah, I mean, burnout is definitely something we talk about a lot. I don't know whether talking about how burnout is real helps us avoid burnout in any tangible way. But, you know, there is something to be said for just at least having it sort of constantly on the table as like, I think we are as a whole really good at, at filling in for folks when they feel the need to take a step back for whatever reason. And, you know, as speaking to the sort of immediacy of mutual aid, like there's nothing that we're doing is so complicated or so specialized that somebody else with very little introduction to it can't just step in and start doing it. Like when we don't enough, have enough drivers, we just put out a post on Instagram saying, hey, do you want to drive grocery deliveries and get a whole influx of new people? Which is great. And, you know, I think having a willingness to just like reach out um, as long as the, the people that are coming in are agreeing to our, our points of unity. Um, you know, that that is a, a good way to do it in, in some ways and not in others. Because like you mentioned in, in the question, that institutional memory, um, there's there's not a lot of good resources for having that body of information be available. Like, I don't know... Right when I started with the free store, we were still calling ourselves decon um, because we were decontaminating yeah. people's groceries. And it was this very hilarious shift where like we hadn't really been doing that for months, but we were still called decon. And so like, I guess that's an example of institutional memory, but I'm not sure if anyone who has joined the free store since kind of we started calling ourselves the, the until we're all free store, um, ha have that understanding of like kind of where we started. Um, but one thing that maybe will help this effort of having some continuity is we have started creating much more intentional space for having monthly collective wide meetings, um, which we've only just begun. Hopefully they will continue in perpetuity um, where people who have been involved for many different lengths of time in the project can all come together and like share experiences and talk about issues that we're facing now and like hopefully also talk about the history of the project. Um, but I do think that institutional memory is something that needs to be built because um, it is it is really important to understand why we're doing things the way that we're doing them now. Yeah. Um, I can talk about hierarchy, I guess. Yeah, you should talk about hierarchy. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try not be too con too controversial because I know other people are the collective are going to listen to this. Um, I think as a product of a desire to keep each other safe uh, in like a realm of organizing that has primarily been digital. And in fact, at one point, like what Fern said about meetings is really interesting because for a while we just stopped having meetings that were like open to anyone. Shit was just getting decided in signal loops. So I think a big, a big part of like challenge, try to challenge hierarchy has been creating more meetings essentially where it's like really clear that anyone who wants to participate in those meetings is welcome to. Um, so that's a part of it. But I think something that exists within the collective is just like trying to figure out like how to include people in decision making without just excluding them. I think something that ends up happening is folks that bottom line a lot of different parts of the project end up accruing a lot of social capital. I say this as someone that has at various points accrued a lot of social capital, um, which just like creates this weird hierarchy of people that feel empowered to make decisions autonomously and just do shit. And then a bunch of people who are like, this person just is making decisions all the time, but I don't understand how they're making decisions, who they're consulting with about them, how this even works. And so I think something that is important for us to be working on as a collective is just like making it really clear that like, once you kind of get the sense of what we're doing, you're like really empowered to make a lot of autonomous decisions and check in with other people about the stuff you want to do, especially if it's going to affect a lot of people. But if you're just going to create work for yourself and it doesn't create work for anyone else, you go ahead and do it. I think it's like where we are successful in like our informal way of making decisions. That was kind of like an in inarticulate mumbly. No, response. I think it made sense. One thing yeah. that I'll add to that is from, from my own thinking about this issue is I think that, a lot of people who are coming to this project, maybe also similarly like myself and like Ducky quote, baby radicals is we've had a lot of experience maybe volunteering or otherwise being involved, but it's with nonprofits and usually working with a nonprofit 
there are very explicit roles and like expectations that you have to meet. And that's just not something that we have other than, you know, follow through on the things that you volunteer yourself to do and to not make life harder for anyone else. And so it can be hard to sort of make the shift to make people feel empowered because A, yeah, like like Ducky was mentioning, kind of the social dynamics of, of the collective are such that not everyone feels like they're quite in group enough to feel like they have the the right or the authority to to make decisions. And also that I think people are not used to being empowered to make those decisions without we, we're we're used to bosses. <laughs> What's interesting about that too, I think, and something I've been thinking about a lot is I think Fern and I definitively are like somewhere in this in-group crowd. And a big part of that is because when we got involved in the free store, it was in this transition period where the people that had been bottom lining it for months at various points kind of all had to step back really quickly. And so the folks, those of us who got involved then all of a sudden had to learn how to do this thing. And there was no one left to tell us how to do it because everyone had left and there was no documentation anywhere. So like, I think some of us have like come into this project and like have strong opinions about how it runs now. Like I'm very opinionated, but we have this empowerment to just make autonomous decisions because we had this experience being involved in the collective when it was like low key in shambles and there was no one left to tell us how to do anything. So we just had to figure it out. Yeah, that sounds like really, like a really important approach. And that's cool if that's like, if that's a continuing dynamic that you get to the new folks are being introduced to have just sort of being given to some degree, like, as you both said, like, yeah, just don't create more work for other people. But if you want to do this thing, go for it. Like, that's, that's pretty cool. Can I add one more thing about informal hierarchies? Please. Uh, while we're on the topic, it's not directly related to, uh, well, it is directly related to the, to the structure of the group, but I would say a huge disadvantage for us in doing the kind of work that we're trying to do is that we operate very, very dependent on technology, like having access to a smartphone, having access to internet, having access to a computer are all things that if you are going to be reliably involved in decision making in the project, like just because of how it has sort of happened and like Mm -hmm. combined with starting this project in the in the space of the pandemic where like it was very hard to be around other people in any capacity for quite a long time um that we kind of defaulted to these like online extremely online uh modes of communication that are just like bottom line not accessible to a lot of the people that we're trying to build community with um and i'm personally of the opinion that if we are actually going to be doing like what could be called mutual aid in the future is like, we will have to go virtually offline. Like, I don't think any of our, (laughs) which, you know, I don't want to say it sound like an and prim or something, but um, like just the reality of like, Oh yeah, well like here person who doesn't have a smartphone or like reliable access to the internet, like how you sign up for shifts at the free store is by going onto this Google doc and coordinating via signal loop with these other random people, it's just like not gonna work. And so I think something that I really want for the collective is to like take a really critical look at, you know, how we came to have the systems that we have and like how can we radically undermine them in order to make ourselves accessible in a meaningful way. Cool. That. <laughs> <laughs> There's another element to, um, to like in some activist communities, how some people accrue social capital and a lot of that has to do which which relates to access to resources sometimes sometimes it's the people that have like you'll see this kind of thing in like school board meetings like the people that have the time and can get their kids like childcare or whatever in some cases can show up to these things and get hyper involved and sometimes in activist scenes the people who show up Um, most consistently and for meetings to make decisions are people who have the ability to not work a wage job and don't have to worry about rent so much to, I don't know that that's, I'm not, that's not me saying anything about ASP in particular, but something that I've like noticed like of my own privilege, like I can work, I can get by working a job four days a week and I'll make rent and I have some extra spending money and some food and whatever. And, but I also don't have kids. I don't have any like 
relatives that I'm taking care of, you know, that would require medical bills getting covered. I don't have medical be bills that need to get covered. That reflects the reality, at the very least, of the way the the hierarchy that is present in the free store working group exists. I mean, because I like I worked at a lotion factory four days a week for a while and was here the three other days of the week. And then like I quit that job at the beginning of the summer because I had saved some money while working and got my last stimulus check. And I've just now started thinking about going back to work. Like I'm starting November 2nd. But um, but because of that, it means I have a shit ton of time. So I'm like at all these meetings. I'm in all the signal loops. I like I'm at the store all the time. But it's because I have this additional resource and privilege around like time that I can choose to do with what I want. Yeah, I think that's a reality of the situation as well. Yeah. Well, so are y'all looking for ASP to grow? And if so, how? Like how can, can folks just show up like find where the store is because we haven't talked about the location very specifically and um, like find out when a meeting is and show up to a meeting or like, um, yeah. What, what, what are you seeing in the future of the project? I mean, I think, can I go, do you care mm -hmm. if I, I think what I'm looking for and looking towards is continuing to do the work. I don't imagine us trying to expand the work we're doing and doing more work. I just imagine us trying to do the work we already do as a collective and doing it better while making it more political. Like, getting really good at running this free store, having real, like continuing to cultivate these real relationships that I have now with folks in the neighborhood. But in terms of getting involved, like the basic prerequisite for being involved and being able to come to like these ASP collective wide meetings is we have this document, which is just our points of unity document that we have new folks read through. And we're like, do you agree to abide by these while doing the work of ASP? And people are like, yeah, usually. Uh, I've not ever had anyone be like, I'm not going to abide by these. So, but basically just like reading through these and these are like, I'm pretty sure and I, this could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure these points of unity are basically just lifted from mutual aid disaster relief matter. They just got like incorporated it into our project at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, if you want, I can send you like a link and you can hyperlink the points of unity. Yeah. And in, in this episode's notes too. For, for folks who are going to be listening though, it, could you kind of go over the general values of them or it's okay if you don't want to, but if you don't have it memorized, we have, we have a, an, a, a very abbreviated version. Uh, I mean, not, I guess just a concise version. I mean, I've got, it. I've got like, I, I, you I just want to rattle them off. I'm not going to rattle them off, but I mean, I think the ones that are really important are ones that have already come up in this conversation. Like there are more of them obviously. And it's like super complicated or nuanced rather, but like, I mean, one of our points of unity is that we as a collective strive to dismantle the barriers between people who give and receive aid. Another point of unity is that we do our work with the end goal of ending all systems of oppression. One of our points of unity is that we're opposed to all forms of bigotry. One of them is that we don't work with the state or call the cops. What Fern was alluding to is so when folks just stop by the store casually and don't want to like read like a full page long document, we have like three uh, like bullet point one versions and it's like pretty straightforward. It's like, do you want to yeah, no bigotry, no bigotry of any kind. Fuck twelve, or for radio friendly, uh, don't call the cops. Screw the, <laughs> screw the, screw the cops. Uh, and what is our third one? You're gonna go look. It's on the board. It's on the board. We're in the store. Oh, you got the, We just heard the chair sound. It's fuck twelve again. Oh, we love drug users. We do not shame drug users for using drugs, and that's the other one. <laughs> so that's like, so at the store, when folks just want to stop by and drop in, we're like, yeah, you're welcome to drop, drop in. Do you care to just like agree to these three things when you're working with us in the store? Um, and yeah, I don't know the best way for folks that are just listening in to be in touch with us. Like, I'm like, you could DM us on Instagram, but well, like. That's kind of true because you'll get somebody who could have a phone conversation with you about our points of unity and about the project as a whole. It'll probably be me. It would probably be Ducky. <laughs> or like one of the two other people that do that. Yeah. That's another talk about burnout. Uh, that's something that we're looking to expand the number of people doing the onboarding. I mean, that seems like an awesome thing that someone could do if they weren't able to share space with people or again, had mobility like issues or, or just that's their, like, that's their jam, I guess. True. I mean, we have someone that doesn't live in town now, like who lives in like Philadelphia, but is like really committed to the project and like, I miss on towards people. I do too. I miss them a lot. I hope they're listening. I yeah, we miss you. Come back.
well, don't you love you like being in Philly more? But keep onboarding people. Thanks. But yeah, I mean, that person doesn't live here anymore, but really cares about this project. And so one of the ways that they contribute, one of many ways that they contribute still is like by being one of the people that will introduce people to the project and help them get connected to different parts of it. That's the Instagram is basically like the public face besides the store. If people are on that app, they can they can reach out. We also have an email address. I I wouldn't rec- the uh, yeah, people could email the email address if they're interested in getting involved or have or have questions or I guess crit- if they want to troll us. Yeah. I don't know if I want to <laughs> it's a, it's a Gmail, it's fine. I'll give it up. But like I'll talk to you after this call and maybe check in with other members of the collective and maybe we can like give folks an option to contact us that way as well cool. so that if they don't have Instagram, they can still get in touch with us. Is there anything that I didn't ask about that y'all wanted to share about? I mean, I will say we always need more people. So if you're listening and you're in the greater Western North Carolina area and you're interested in this kind of work, come check it out. We're all learning. None of us know how to do this. We're all figuring it out as we go. So having more people that are excited um, and aren't super flaky, like love everybody, but half of us are total flakes, myself included half the time. I'm like, oh, whatever. I don't know if I'm going to go, but maybe cut that out. It's fine if you're flaky, actually. <laughs> you do what you need. It's up to your spoons and capacity. Flake as much as you want. Dandruff is cool. Um, but yeah, we just always need more people. It's like a lot of hard work, but ultimately I would say that like ASP is like a huge part of my life at this point because it really is meaningful work that is important. And I have like built, yeah, really profound relationships that have like further radicalized me uh, and helped clarify my vision and my politic uh, in ways that have been like kind of incredible. So yeah, I think, I mean, the last thing is just like, come, come check us out, get involved if you want. Yeah. Doing mutual aid is better than staring into the void. True that. <laughs> That's what's going up on the window. <laughs> I mean, it's basically on our mirror in the bathroom. Yeah. I think our mirror in the bathroom has like, you look so good doing mutual you aid. Look great. You look great. You look great doing mutual aid. <laughs> oh, and if someone, I mean, I would imagine that if someone's in another city and they're listening to this and they've been thinking about starting a mutual aid project or they work with one and they wanted to get a hold of y'all to swap stories or or talk about you know ways of ways of doing stuff that the instagram and possibly email would be a pretty good way to do that too huh sounds like a good idea it sounds like a good idea <laughs> please contact us so we can swap ideas i'll put the email in the show notes and and uh, announce it also thank you so much fern and ducky for having this conversation and again making the time to chat for the work that y'all do yeah thank you burst really appreciate it and now some words from anarchist prisoner sean swain the fascist bozos of ineptitude are at it again. I really wish they'd grow up, get a life, move on. I talk about the FBI quite frequently. Earlier this year, I talked about their history of ideologically targeting folks on the political left, surveilling them, sabotaging them, and even engaging in assassinations. One of their victims was Fred Hampton, a Black Panther in Chicago, the subject of Judas and the Black Messiah. I also talked about my own personal history being targeted by the FBI, how they used a lawyer for the Ohio prisons to operate a domestic torture program, and how that lawyer engaged in a creepy sexual assault groping me during an interrogation he claimed that the FBI ordered. So, if the FBI ordered the groping, that makes the FBI ball grabbers by proxy. If that lawyer really was operating on FBI orders, the FBI grabbed my balls. They're no longer the fascist bozos of ineptitude. They're the fascist ball grabbers of ineptitude. FBI Director Christopher Wray my junk is in your hand. My junk is in your hand. Truth, justice, and the American way. So, I think there's a great argument for abolishing the FBI. And I've articulated that. April 11th of this year, I talked about how anarchist prisoners across the country are seemingly targeted and monitored. This call is originating from an Ohio correctional facility and may be recorded and monitored. And subjected to suppression that has to be centralized. 
and how the FBI, when they weren't busy trying to get their hands down my pants, were busy communicating back and forth with Virginia prison officials, plotting on how to make me shut up about them. You know, because there's nothing more American than trying to get people to stop telling the truth, silencing free speech, trampling the Constitution. That's what the FBI is into, almost as much as massaging my testicles. Hopefully, with any luck and the magic of the interweb, bursts can locate all these segments in case folks want to hear them again, because I think there's nothing bursts and joys more than going back and creating links to all my old crap. You're welcome. Anyhow, friends and supporters filed another Freedom of Information Act FOIA request in order to find out what the Virginia prisons and the FBI were discussing about me. And for anyone who never filed a FOIA, you should know. Getting information from these fuck weasels is like pulling teeth. The FBI's first answers were that everything was exempt from disclosure because it would violate prison officials' privacy. Yeah, their privacy. As if they have an expectation of privacy when acting as a public official on a public email communicating with another public agency. As if Virginia Prison's operations director, Dave Robinson, was sharing intimate details of his sex life with pets in emails to the FBI. When, you know, everyone knows they only discuss that by phone. So, we resubmitted the FOIA request to be sure and exclude any private materials to personal email domains. In response to that, the FBI said they could not locate any responsive documents. Important here to note, they didn't say there weren't any, only that they could not locate any. What the fascist ball grabbers didn't know is that a friend had already filed FOIA with the Virginia prisons, and Virginia Department of Corrections admitted that emails were exchanged, and how many, and when. So, I wrote the fascist ball grabbers yet again, and I informed them of the Virginia Department of Corrections admissions and asked them, how can they locate those documents when you can't? You're the Federal Bureau of what? So finally, this past week, I've received the FOIA answers we've been waiting on. Finally. The fascist ball grabbers admit that there were pages and pages of email exchanges between the FBI and the Virginia Department of Corrections discussing me, but only sent me 14 of those pages. Of those 14 pages, almost every single line of text was blacked out, as were the names of the officials from both agencies. You know, because fascists are cowards particularly when they're engaged in illegal conspiracies to silence the truth. But there's one email they didn't black out. It was sent by a Virginia Department of Corrections administrator to an agent of the FBI on April 19th, just eight days after my radio segment for the final straw, where I talked about the FBI continuing its illegal counterintelligence program to ideologically target me and others. Here's the text of that email from one anonymous criminal plotter at the Virginia Department of Corrections to another anonymous criminal plotter at the FBI. Just an FYI, Swain is recording radio segments where he states he is under FBI investigation. He says the FBI has over 4,000 pages of information on him, but he has never been charged with anything. He states that the FBI is still operating COINTELPRO to suppress anti-political thought. He also said that he received information from the FBI, that they previously sent him documentation, and he owes money for that. He says he has not seen it and is requesting it again. The subject line of this email asks, can I call you? I think I probably don't need to point out how disturbing this is, that the FBI is more concerned about what I'm saying on the Final Straw radio show about their criminal behavior than they are concerned about ending their criminal behavior. 
They engage in dozens of communications with prison officials, worried about how much I'm telling the truth on the final straw, and thereby proving everything I already said about them. Clearly, COINTELPRO was alive and well. The FBI and its vast network of proxies are monitoring, surveilling, and suppressing speech about themselves and about their own crimes. And now that I told the truth again, they'll undoubtedly generate more files and engage in more plots to silence me. And I'll file for you and discover their criminal conduct and expose it. And on and on it goes. But what fucking creeps? They're so focused on what I'm saying about them, all of it true, that they can't stop the deliverance crew from taking the Capitol building and pooping on Nancy Pelosi's desk. They're so focused on covering up their outsourced ball grabber sex crimes that they drop the ball on Larry Nasser. They'd rather target and silence the truth I tell about them than stop a serial rapist from victimizing the entire women's Olympic gymnastics team. What the fuck? Why does this agency exist? Why do these cowardly creepos even have jobs? How is the world better because millions of dollars of taxpayer money funds these fuck weasels' criminal plots? And a question for the FBI directly, quoting the wisdom of Regina George from Mean Girls. Why are you so obsessed with me? I hate to tell you this, FBI. I'm married. I moved on. Find someone else. And please... Keep your hands off my balls. This is anarchist prisoner Sean Swain from the super duper uber mega hyper ultra turbo multi maxi max in Youngstown, Ohio. If the FBI proxies are grabbing you by the crotch, you are the resistance. You can write to Sean Swain at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A243205 OSP Youngstown 878 Coitsville Hubbard Road, Youngstown, Ohio, 44505. If you'd like to see some of his writings, check out easy ways to get a hold of his books, or make donations to his legal support, you can visit seanswain.org. Hey, that shows a market increase in our listenership. If we've got agents in the federal government listening, they can contribute to our uh, Patreon at, at least, right? Yeah, but yeah, and they should, and they should, because it's job security for them. Yeah. So, agents, if you're listening right now, check out patreon.com slash TFSR. Uh, yeah, we've got a lot of great gifts that are available in exchange for your kind contributions. Merch. Merch. Yeah. Merch. we got merch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But at the same time, please keep your hands off our balls. Yes, please. Yes, please. You fucking weirdos. <laughs> if you appreciate the work here at the final straw consider following us on social media subscribing to our podcast rating us on itunes google and other terrible places especially with people irl who you think may enjoy it or by getting in touch with us if you have some extra cash and you want to buy a friend a t-shirt or yourself some stickers or subscribe to our patreon the funds we collect go to cover our monthly transcription costs and hosting fees and gives us hope for a new tomorrow. Check out our transcribed interviews at https colon slash slash tfsr dot wtf slash zines for reading, printing, sharing, and translating purposes. This is The Final Straw, and I'm Bursa Goodness. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop. Έγινε ο κόσμο μια μεγάλη φυλακή. Και εγώ ψάχνω έναν τρόπο τάδεσμα να σπάσω. Έχω ένα μέρο που με περιμένει εκεί. Σε μια πολύ ψηλή κορφή πρέπει να φτάσω. Για αυτά πλέον ξανά πολύ ψηλά τα δυο μου χέρια. 
αστέρια για να κλέψω λίγο φως από τα λάβερα αστέρια Δεν αντέχω εδώ κάτω και κοντεύει να με πλήξει των ανθρώπων η μιζέρια Τόσο όσο και θρύψει δεν αντέχω Άντε κι όλοι αυτοί δεν μου ταιριάξαν Πήρα τ' άλλο μόνο πράτη και όχι αυτό που μου χαράξαν Ήταν δύσβατο σκληρό και με παγίδες πολλές Αγάπες κάρτες και φίλοι φαρμάκερες οχές Είχε τέρατα με παράξενες στολές Που παράμονευαν πάντοτε κρυφά με στις σκιές Μην κοντοσταθείς, να πρόκειται να ακολουθήσεις Τα δόντια σπίξε γερά και μη δακρύσεις Εγώ το πήγα και το έφτασα στο τέρμα Και όπως γράφουν στα βιβλία Η παλή σοφή όταν θα φτάσει Ο ήλιος στο τελευταίο γέρμα Θα βάλουνε φωτιά από ψηλά οι αετοί Για σους με πρόδωσαν με πίσω μαχαιριές Θέλω να ξέρουν ότι Ποιος είμαι απειλής αν με πήρει να δες μα θέλω να ξέρουν ότι Σιγάνι φοβικό Να αρθούνε να με βρουν στην κορυφή ψηλά τους περιμένω και Σιγάνι φοβικό Μου είπα να μην κάνω όνειρα τρελά Να μην τολμήσω να κοιτάξω τα αστέρια Μα εγώ ποτέ μου δεν τους πήρα σοβαρά Πήρα τον κόσμο ολοκληρό στα δυο μου χέρια Θέλουνε τώρα να μου φτιάξουν μια θωριά Που έχει πάνω της το φόβο την ασχήμια Και ένα κλάμα γοερό και μια λυσίδα βαριά Κουβαλάει την κατάρα των θεών και την πλασφήμια Δεν θα δακρύσω μα δεν και θα φοβηθώ Δεν θα αφήσω να μου κλέψουν τα μοιρά μου ελευθερά ψηλά Πολύ ψηλά πετώ Κι όλοι ζηλεύουν τα περήφανα κι αδες με τα φτερά μου Και περιμένω κι άλλα αδέρφια για να βγουν Σ' αυτή την κορυφή που όλους περιμένει αρχή Να μην τα κλείσουν και να μην φοβηθούν Σ' αυτήν την έξυπνη απάτη την καλωστημένη Για σους με πρόδωσαν με πίσω μαχαιριές Θέλω να ξέρουν ότι Σιγάνι κάψου Και για αυτές τις αγάπες τις παλιές Θέλω να ξέρουν ότι Σιγάνι κάψου Ποιος είμαι αφήλης αν με πήρει να δες Μα θέλω να ξέρουν ότι Σιγάνι φοβηθού Να αρθούνε να με βρουν στην κορυφή ψηλά Τους περιμένω και για σους με πρόδωσαν με πίσω μαχαιριές Θέλω να ξέρουν ότι Σιγάνι κάψου Και για αυτές τις αγάπες τις παλιές Θέλω να ξέρουν ότι Σιγάνι κάψου Ποιος είμαι αφήλης αν με πήρει να δες Μα θέλω να ξέρουν ότι Σιγάνι φοβηθού Να αρθούνε να με βρουν στην κόρη Βιψηλά τους περιμένω και